Glyn, if, if you wouldn't mind coming to the stage. Dr. Glyn oh, Brokenshaw, of course. Uh, medical doctor. And uh, he looks to, like a medical doctor, doesn't just he? have to collect he actually, box tops. You know. <laughs> he actually started in Myrtleford, is that right? Yes. In Victoria. And it's a bit like a country vet, but a doctor. So talk us through... There is a difference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was never good with yeah, that. Um, talk us through what it was like being a doctor in a country town and what those lessons have... have what you've got from, from that being a business owner now. Or is there any, you know, mm. co correlation? Oh, lots. Um, the one thing you can't be in a country town of 3,000 people is not yourself. Yeah. Because the person you're dealing with now is the person who's going to be emptying your garbage tomorrow yeah. or fixing your car the day after yeah. or they're the dentist or the dentist child or whatever it might be. Yeah. So if you have an act, then before long, you have Thank a huge you. difficulty keeping up that act because yeah. it's a different act for every person. Yeah. So being authentic and having high integrity starts with that. And, and I guess I was lucky in that respect. My dad started life driving rivets in a dockyard, so he was a dockyard worker. Uh, and at the end of his career, he was quite a senior naval architect. So in terms of a career trajectory, he was someone who came from nothing mm. uh, and then wound up very senior in the British civil service. Mm. So, so an authenticity, authenticity naturally comes game. from that. So that fitted very well for me. Yeah. And it was easy to be authentic. And it taught me just to be real. Yeah. And the reason I asked that of Glyn was because when I interviewed Glyn off, off the line before this interview, he was telling me some really personal things about the fear experience and some of the, the really low points in his career. And I said, Glyn, that's really big of you to share that kind of story with you. But I, do you want me to tell the audience that? You know, do you want it, that to come out? And he said, absolutely. He said, authenticity is everything. And he was very honest about that. And I thought that was a nice message. So let's talk about your business in sure. terms of you're a doctor, you love the yeah. counselling side, and you translated that into a product. What was that product? Well, in a nutshell, whilst I was a GP, I got to be interested in psychotherapy. Whilst I was a psychotherapy uh, practitioner, I got to be interested in understanding more about the person in front of me than I could actually understand by interviewing them, by talking with them. Mm. And, and so I put together a series of, of surveys that began for me to flesh out the person in front of me when they weren't sitting in front of me in that nice, quiet, relaxed, one-hour therapy encounter. So uh, it helped me understand what was going wrong out there that I wouldn't necessarily see here. Mm. Uh, and that was fine, and that was what I did. And I did about, I think, about nearly 3,500 in-depth debriefs of that instrument that I used in my practice every day. And so some of those were quite longitudinal because I practiced for a long time, so uh, mm. t over 10 years. Mm. So I got very good at understanding what this was telling me. Mm. Uh, and then Carolyn came along. Uh, Don't stand up, uh, Carolyn, because you're business partners. And a round of applause yes. for the other, the other half of the business. Well and done. She should really be the one who's here because she's really got the entrepreneurial spirit. She just prods me along the path. So how did you guys knows. meet? Oh, that's a long is story. Is that relevant? No, yeah. no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point I want to make is that was the collaboration is what yes. enabled this product to occur. So talk us through that collaboration. Mm. What were the conversations you had? Carolyn had a task to fit a large number of people into an organisation that was being listed on the stock exchange. So from a small business at the back of Napache in, in Rundle Street, she had to fill the organisational chart so she could get the business listed on the stock exchange in 12 months. The business was called Hostworks. It had one major customer called 9MSN. So um, they were going places. And so she said, look, I can't possibly fill this organisational chart, do all these interviews, read all these resumes, get all these bums on seats for people who are really quite different. I mean, we've got geeks and we've got uber geeks with deference to Uber, who are coming later. We've got geeks, we've got Uber geeks, and we've got mega geeks, right? So how do I find the right people? So she said, what you do with this instrument in your practice will work for that. And I said, no, it won't. No, 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 no. it's, it's really a, a counselling debriefing tool. Yeah. It won't work for recruitment yeah. at all. Yeah. And she said, yes, it will. And I was like, okay, <laughs> Yeah, so can you put it on the internet? Yeah. Uh, and I got through med school by doing a little bit of computer programming, so I've got some computer skills. So I yeah. said, oh, I think I can probably do that. Yeah. And that's really where the idea was born of collecting and distributing this information back through the internet. Mm. 
we've been through several pivots since then, as one does, um, but that's how it got started. Great idea. So talk me through, the best way to understand this product, it's called Express, right? Yes. The best way to understand it is to do a case study. So let's talk about Beaumont tiles. Okay. Okay, so let's talk us through what Beaumont tiles needed and what you did for them. Okay, so Beaumont tiles have been a customer now for nearly 10 years. Uh, and when they came along, they said, okay, we want, we're looking for something that's going to give us a method to our recruitment processes, a process that anyone can follow, that makes it reproducible, that makes it defensible, that leaves an audit trail. And that's all the, like, the administrative stuff. But the most important thing for us is actually keep getting people who will actually be productive and stay. Because if you've ever hired staff, you'll know that losing one staff member costs you at least 150% of that person's salary. Uh, and some estimates would say 250%. So losing people is really expensive. And they, I know they won't mind me saying this, they had a turnover at that stage of 22.5%. So more than one person in five was leaving every year. So they said, can what you do reduce that? And I said, I'd be surprised if we can't, because by this stage, I'd bought Carolyn's story, I'd drunk the Kool-Aid, and I actually believed in what we were doing. It took two years, but, but it worked. So I said, yeah, we can. And we said, yes, we can do that. In one year, they dropped their staff turnover rate to about 12%. And now, 10 years later, they're running at 2.5%. Yeah, right. So now, 2.5% is a bit low. So they need to raise that with natural healthy turnover. But you have to understand that coming out of a period of very high turnover, yeah. it's, you're bound to undershoot yeah. and then come back up a bit. Yeah. So, so it's quite an interesting product. And I encourage you to look at it, express.com. Correct. Yeah. So here's the thing. I really do. It's a, you have to go online and look at it because it's, it's um, a product that is, I think, really disrupting the, the recruitment industry. Mm. But let's talk about your journey as an entrepreneur, Glenn, because okay. there was a moment where you... Uh, Things were pretty grim, weren't they? Oh, yes. Talk we, us through we, the grim moment. Yeah, we, we got down to our last 10,000, <laughs> but it was 10,000. Sold the house, sold the car, nowhere to live. Um, and uh, just an idea and a firm conviction that this was really the thing to do. And what got us into that mess uh, in the first place was taking what we did, which was working and quite expensive, a roundabout par for the course uh, for any kind of psychometric instrument, in the five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar per report. Sorry, six, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar. Yeah. There. Um, per for, report. Per report. Mm. And we came to the realization that the right place for a temperament survey, a character survey, to work out whether this person is the right person for our business is not at the end when you've got a short list of three, but at the very beginning when you've got a list of 300 or 100 or 30 or whatever it is, so that you can do two things. You can stop spending a lot of time reading resumes, which is unproductive, stop conducting interviews, which don't work. If they did work, then we wouldn't have a divorce rate of 19% in the first year, because most of us have fairly intimate interviews before we get married. So if interviewing worked, why is the divorce rate so high? So, and all the research shows us that interviewing and resume reading contributes a big fat zero to actual selection accuracy. You might as well throw darts in the dartboard. And if you're a below average interviewer, and everyone thinks they're an above average interviewer, an above average resume like reader, yeah, an okay above driver. average driver. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a below average in those things, you might actually throw darts in a dartboard and be more accurate yeah. than you are. Yeah. So we said, let's put this testing, this promotion idea, let's uh, call it interview priority. So let's give our customers information about which people they should be focusing on early, quickly, engaging in a conversation with, creating a dialogue with, which is the modern way, mm, mm. and getting them engaged with talking to the business. Not so much that you can or can't do this job, but rather you're more likely to succeed mm, or less likely mm. to succeed. And I think the point that's important for entrepreneurs to understand is it was a $600 product to start mm. with, and then you brought it down to, was it 25 Yes. Dollars? yes. That's a big change. And I think the lesson there is if things aren't working, change it up. Absolutely. And make it an easy trial sample yes. or something. So talk us through just what impact that it's, reduction in price had. Oh, huge. That's what got us to the $10,000. You know, we went, went backwards dramatically because we were actually not hugely profitable. We had a nice little consulting business using this instrument. We had good customers like Accor Advantage Plus and Talent2 and so on. So we were sort of comfortable, but mm. we could see that there was potential. Mm. We both felt philosophically the right place 
for t looking at attitudes and values is not at the end of the recruitment process, but right at the beginning. That way you can also bring forward some of the people who are the, what we call the looks wrong, but is right people. And we've got a fund of stories of people who don't have the right resume, don't quite have the right qualifications, don't have quite have the right experience, but turn out to be exemplary employees mm. because they're the right kind of people. People don't fire on skills. Mm. They fire on attitudes, mm. but they hire on skills and that's what gets them into the mess. Yeah. So we said, let's put it early, let's make it inexpensive, let's make it really quick so people can get results just like that, instantly, and that way they can focus on the high likelihood people. It won't always be right, no test ever is. But you can focus on the high likelihood people and that will drop your staff turnover. Radio Rentals drop their staff turnover in 24 months uh, by a factor of two. So they halved their staff turnover. Mm -hmm. And their other business, RT Edwards, reduced their staff turnover to 30%. Mm -hmm. Now, that pays for an awful lot of Express. Yeah. In fact, it more than pays yeah. for Express. And it also saves wastage in the economy. What we're talking about today with disruptors is taking waste out, mm -hmm. taking friction, taking unnecessary losses out of the business transactions. Mm -hmm. And we conservatively estimate now that we save Australian business in total, the Australian economy, yes, this is my little election manifesto here, the Australian economy, half a billion dollars a year mm. at least mm. in just pure waste. Yeah. So Glenn, I'm just gonna just change to tack yeah, a little yeah. bit. The name is interesting, Express with an E, right? What was your theory behind that? Because naming is so important, which I talked to Andre about, but what was the, the, the theory behind yeah. that? I should tell you the, the, I should tell you the um, official story but I, I actually have to tell you the real story since I have to be authentic. <laughs> the official story is that there are three things that are important in recruitment, can do, will do, and fit to. So the three stands for get me the can do people who will fit to the role and, and will do the role well. Can do, will do, fit to. Got it in the wrong order. So can do, will do, fit to, yeah, that's the three. The other day, the thing is that three days is now a long time in the recruitment cycle. Yeah. So if you're not getting back and engaging in dialogue with job applicants within three days, they're already beginning to devalue your employment brand, and that's yeah. inextricably also yeah. linked with your product brand. And the final thing is, if you turn the E round in recruitment to a three, you're really turning recruitment round. Right. But the truth is, <laughs> we wanted to call it Express. We couldn't get the domain name. That's not a good story. Yeah. No, stick with the first one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there was a TV program called Numbers. Do you remember Numbers? Yeah. That had the three yeah, yeah. turned around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, we can get EXPR3SS. Let's try with that. Yeah. You know? so I met you all sorts of SEO <laughs> issues, but we won't go into that right now. So one question I want to finish on is yeah. you talked about work-life balance because you are really putting in the long hours and, yes. and it costs you in lots of ways. Talk us through some lessons you've learned. How do you find that balance when you've got a brand new startup and you've got people's money uh, riding on your back? How do you uh, keep that balance? Look, I think this one's really important. The, the first thing is there is no such thing as work-life balance. It doesn't exist. Work is a part of life. So if you find the right work, you don't need the balance because work is your life. What you just have to work, watch out for is fatigue and burnout, and they're different things. But getting a work-life balance as an entrepreneur, forget it. If you're working eight hours a day, I'd say, what's wrong with the other six? Yeah. Sleep is for wimps. Yeah, so, so, truly, if you're out there starting to build a business, if you're not very well capitalised with all sorts of friends with lots of money, so... <laughs> <laughs> and, and great, I wish we had been there at the beginning too, I really do. But if you're just starting on a shoestring, truly, then you've just got to put in the hours because you've got to make the product, you've got to get it out there, you've got to market it, you've got to get your turnaround customer, which for us was another Adelaide business, Spend Less Shoes. We started in Adelaide, yeah. So Spend Less Shoes was our turnaround customer when we suddenly went, whew, instead of actually using up our last 10,000 over the next month or two, yeah, we're actually going to put a little bit of money in the bank this yeah. month. Yeah. So you've got to be able to put 110% of yourself into the entrepreneurial activity. And I also think you have to believe in the product that you have mm. because mm. at the end of it, say you get rich. I've got this great idea for scamming Australia and I get rich. So at the end, you're just a rich cheat. Mm. Mm. And you know you're a cheat. Maybe other people do as well. Mm. But you always know you're mm. a cheat. So, mm. you know, integrity, mm. accountability, and being able to say at the end of it that I did something that I feel was worthwhile yeah. is, yeah. you know, ultimately that's what all of us want. Yeah, we want the money in the first place, but, mm. but 
we need the money to survive. But at the end of it, when you've got that, when you're a successful entrepreneur, what's left? Mm. Just you and your money, you know? Mm. And the important thing is you, because anyone can get money. What a wonderful, wonderful lesson. Thank you so much. Thank Lynn. you. Please join me. Thank you. Lynn. Thank